Hello, thanks for joining our Facebook Live event at CBC News. I'm Conrad Colasso. One Monday night, Hamilton's Tim Bosma went out for a ride with two men who said they wanted to buy his truck and never came back. That was in May of 2013. For so many people since then, Tim Bosma has been on our minds a lot. Many of you have followed the trial of the two men accused of his murder every day since it began in February. The first witness called was his wife, Charlene. Most who followed this story almost every day didn't know Tim Bosma personally, but we knew that he was loved. We knew that he had a young daughter, and we knew that when he went missing, his wife pleaded for his return. Charlene said, you don't need him, but I do. It's been three years since that day, and now the verdict is close. Will the jury decide that Dellen Millard and Mark Smitch killed Tim Bosma? We'll likely find out soon. I'm joined by three people who have told this story right from the beginning of the trial. CBC reporters Colin Butler, Shannon Martin, and Adam Carter. They'll be taking your questions and comments over Facebook. You send them in, and we'll read them and ask them here. So all of you have been telling the story of this trial for months. Adam, you started reporting on this trial from when Tim Bosma disappeared. What so far has been the moment, the event that has stood out most to you since the trial began? I would probably have to be the moment that Mark Smitch was describing the night in question. I mean, it's the closest we've ever gotten to a first person account to what happened to Tim Bosba. And I don't know about you guys, but I never really kind of thought we were ever going to get that. Mm -hmm. So to actually hear it coming out of his mouth was, I mean, I mean, you could hear a pin drop in that courtroom. And I mean, that was the time when we saw um, Tim's mother, Mary, uh, just run out of the courtroom because she couldn't handle it. And they sat mm -hmm. through so much testimony and they've, they've heard so many gruesome things. And that was the moment that she just kind of went, I can't, I can't do this. And I, I totally understand that because it was, it was just brutal to try and listen to. How about you? Um, that was definitely a standout, but yeah. also um, you guys may remember when the forensic scientist was on the stand, the woman who climbed inside the animal incinerator. Tracy Rogers, Rogers. Rogers. Yeah. Rogers yeah. So she was talking about how she tried to sweep up as much ash as possible. So here's this scientist, yeah. this woman who's a world leader, and she started tearing up on the stand when she described that moment. And so when she left, Tim's father, Hank, followed her out and we could see him hugging her in the hallway. And to me, that was just such a human moment because you know what they were feeling in that moment. What about you, Colin? Well, I, I mean, the family in general, just the way they've, stayed, they've kept it together throughout this trial has really amazed me. Um, I mean, that, that moment really stood out for me. But mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the stuff that happened behind the scenes, this wasn't even in the courtroom. I mean, there was the day where they brought in the, uh, the Dutch salt licorice drops. The drop yeah. is, and, and we all had to try one. And then they brought in syrup cookies after that. The treats, the jokes. I mean, even today we were talking about how uh, the court clerk Murray hates it when you chew gum in court because it's against the rules, obviously. But uh -huh. I mean, the other day she was un slowly unwrapping a piece of gum in front of him and, and going, oh, <laughs> oh, Murray, look at the gum. Like there's their sense of humor has just mm -hmm. risen above the chaos and mm. and just the awfulness of this entire proceeding, and and that's really stood out to me. In the comments that are coming in now to our Facebook page and the ones we've seen from people who have been following your coverage right from the beginning, it seems that those moments with the families or the family um, are the things that stand out as well. We have a question from Donna who asks on Facebook, did the accused look at the Bosma family in court at all during the trial? How did the family react when Smitch or Nudga took the stand? Mm. Well, the accused looked at them every day, at least Dylan Millard did, right? Millard definitely did. Yeah, every yeah. time he walks into the courtroom, he, he looks into the public gallery, makes direct eye contact with the Bosma family, who's mm. in the front row, and then all of their supporters. He turns and looks at us, members of the media. He's making contact, eye contact constantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smitch, I think, is a little less so. He has seemed very stoic throughout the entire thing, and it's, he's very much sitting there looking straight ahead. Mm -hmm. Millard looks at Smitch a lot, too. Right. Like, he'll look him up and down and kind yeah. of scoff at him and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and Smitch is just not having any of it. He's just there. He's, he, he really seems like he's kind of off in his own world as much as possible. I don't know if that's, you know, he's instructed to act that way uh -huh. or how it is, but it's, yeah, he, he's, he's much less expressive than Millard, for sure. Do you have a sense of 
how the family, you've described some of the physical, emotional reactions the family um, has had to the evidence. What sense do you get about how they've been able to deal with this trial over the long four-month process? It's, it's uh, partly that sense of humor, but it's also the Bosma army. I mean, mm. I've, I, I've covered a number of major murder trials, and I don't think I've ever seen so many people out out to show up for the, the victim's family. Mm -hmm. Like the first four rows in the public gallery, at least they were yesterday, were filled with what's been called the Bosma Army. And these, these are the same people who uh, are, they pray every morning uh, for that God will do justice at this, this proceeding. And then they also, these are the same people that put up Tim's uh, missing posters mm -hmm. the day he vanished. Uh, and, and they've been there throughout. And it's, it, that is one of the reasons that I think they've been able to weather this storm. Their faith is very strong, and even um, we see them praying in the mornings, but then yesterday for the first time we saw members of their church community, they set up a booth outside the courthouse. And so now that the jury is deliberating, members of their community want people to just come and write a prayer or send their support um, to the family. So I think that that is something uh, unique to them, and that's, I know, been throughout all of this how the struggles of the Bosma family have been supported by the community around them. Mm -hmm. This trial has connected with so many people, many people who had, uh, didn't know the Bosma family at all. What do you think it is about this story that so deeply connects with people? Because Tim is everybody. Everyone mm -hmm. out there has tried to sell something on, online. Everyone has done something as innocuous as he was doing. Everyone can put themselves in his shoes. And I think that's what makes it so terrifying for so many people is because they can all place themselves right there with him. And that makes it just so terrifying well, and so gruesome. And the allegation is that uh, the, the accused killers in this case killed a total stranger. Yeah. That's yeah. the other thing. Totally it's, random. I, and it, it really did, I think, strike fear into the hearts of a lot of people. And, and, and the fact that Tim Bosma has no background, no, he wouldn't hurt anybody. From what we know, he's he's a nice guy who has a family and a daughter, and, and like you say, he could be any one of us. Yeah, and that he was at his home, and these two strangers walked up the driveway, and he had just put his daughter to bed, and just everything you hear, that could have been me, that could have been my brother, or my husband, you know, it just connects with everyone right across the country. We've heard that from people. Uh, people on Facebook want to know about those two strangers, what you observed about their character, their demeanor. This question comes in from Chris. Thank you, Chris, for asking. You've sat in the room and watched the two accused. Mm -hmm. How would you profile them by how they sat day after day through the proceedings? Did anything jump out at you on their demeanor? Did they fidget, stare at individuals on the stand, and why? Uh, well, as I said before, like, it, Smitch is very stoic. He's very dialed in. The only time I ever saw any bit of emotion out of him was the day that his ex-girlfriend, Marlena Menezes, mm -hmm. testified. That, that day, I, he kind of broke out of that a little bit, and you could see his face, like, really searching for her, I guess, on the stand. And the other thing about uh, Smitch is when he testified about her, he, would, he kept saying things like she would never, I'd never say anything bad about her, or she'd right. never do anything wrong. Like, he still clearly has feelings for her. But otherwise, he didn't show a whole lot of emotion. Millard, on the other hand, you see a lot in his face. Um, every time that Smitch's lawyers were taking a run at him for something, he'd kind of turn and do this mm. and look him up and down and scoff. And um, there was the one day that he even jumped up. Um, oh yeah, he stood up in court, and he, the judge the judge didn't like that. That was after um, Thomas Dungy had talked about um, Halo as being a killing game, and he repeatedly referred to that first-person shooter mm. as a killing game. And I guess uh, Millard wanted to point out the fact that this was something that a lot of different people had played or something like that. But when the jury was out of the room, he actually stood up and said, Your Honor, which is not how that generally is supposed to go. And immediately there was kind of this panic in the courtroom and they conferred with him and it went on like that. But yeah, he's definitely been the more expressive of the two, I think. And do you remember him waving? Oh, he yeah. Waved oh, yeah. A number of times yeah, the, the homicide detectives. Yeah, there was a couple of times. So mm -hmm. when they would first. Some a witness on the stand would first mention Millard, he'd sort of smile and wave. And I remember the first couple of times, like you could hear an audible kind of ooh in the courtroom from the public gallery. It was just so 
unexpected and casual. I would describe casual and, and confident, sometimes even cocky for Millard. Yeah is how I would observe him for sure. And I, I think the most expressive I saw him is when his uncle testified, mm. the, the veterinarian, uh, right. Robert Burns. And he actually turned all the way around in his seat yes. and looked back to see his uncle come in the room, followed him around, and you could just feel the mm -hmm. tension, this, this family feud between the two men. And it was there, it was palpable in the room. And mm -hmm. yeah, the, the court was very careful to avoid anything coming out that they didn't want to be shared with the jury, that's for sure. Yeah. Aside from testifying, we have a question from Leo who wants to know, uh, aside from testifying, did the families of, of the accused um, uh, attend the trial? So the Smitch's family has been there. Mm -hmm. uh, they've never full out said they are who they are, but uh, we believe it's his mother and his sister have been mm -hmm. there, uh, possibly more than one sister. Millard's family, we haven't really ever seen. There's a woman who sits in the space allotted for them, um, who we don't think is related in any way, but she shows up every day and she's got a Bible or a religious text and Millard nods to her when he's coming in the courtroom. But other than that, it doesn't seem like he's had much in the way of support. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have noticed any different, but. I, I haven't noticed personally. I, I mean, I, uh, one of the other reporters has told me that his sister was there one day, but I, I wouldn't know what she looked like, so I couldn't yeah. confirm mm -hmm. that. What, uh, after sitting in the trial for four months, what impressions did you get of the three legal teams that were present? We saw three very different legal stra strategies and three very different personalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I actually, I loved the personalities of lawyers. I mean, you had uh, Ravine Pillay, who's this uh, very, he's, he's a logician. I mean, he's, everything's a strategy. Everything fits into its place, and he mm -hmm. uses logic to make most of his arguments. You have Thomas Dungy, who's in the tradition of the, the movie lawyer, like yeah. Atticus Finch, who thunders and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he yells on the, like, as, if, as if the lectern were a pulpit. And there's usually a moral tone to everything he does. Yeah. And then you have uh, Tony Leach, who, uh, as a crown attorney, is, I, I would say, the crusader. I mean, he, he's uh, this warrior who believes in what he's doing, and he's mm -hmm. very idealistic, and he really thinks that the public has a right to know. Mm -hmm. And so he would like to make as much public as possible in this case. And he's been, uh, he's been very forthcoming with a lot of uh, stuff behind the scenes, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they've made their cases. They've shown their different personalities. How did the jury seem to react to the accused and their uh, legal teams? Did you get a sense of how the jury felt about I, the testimony? I don't know about you guys, but I feel they've been very stone-faced. Yeah. They have, except That's one woman. One woman, I'm not sure if you've noticed, was looking at um, Millard a lot. I found that she was staring straight at him. Hmm. Um, and I actually heard the court um, officers comment on that and said somebody's going to have to tell her to stop. So she had sort of been staring straight at Millard, but otherwise, yes, not not much emotion. Yeah, they've been very stoic, is your word. They, mm -hmm. They've been watching everything very carefully, mm -hmm. and a lot mm -hmm. of them have been taking notes. Yes, and, yes. Uh, so they're certainly paying attention, but it's really difficult to get a read mm -hmm. of exactly what they're thinking. They're not, they're not showing it too much. That question, I should mention, comes from April. April, thank you for asking that. We are still taking questions on our Facebook page, so please continue to send them. Um, we have another question about uh, how is it possible, and this one comes from Judy. This uh, gets into the evidence a little bit more directly. And we have several questions about people who want to know specifics about the evidence that uh, you might have seen that might not have uh, made it through to readers. How is it possible that the jury does not know about the other charges against the accused when those charges were laid in April of 2014 before the trial? Well, I would have thought that it wasn't possible. But I got to tell you, since I published a story last night about what the jury didn't hear, I've had probably 15 or 20 emails where people are shocked about those charges and they had mm. no idea. Mm. So, I mean, not everybody is going to follow the news judiciously. Not everybody is going to pay that much attention. Not everyone's going to remember. So, yeah, it's possible. The jury might not have known. Some, I mean, yeah. I'm sure some of the jury members did. Yeah. There's no way that out of all those people, no one knew. But it's, it's entirely possible that some of them just didn't. And they screened them too, yeah. right? Yeah. So they had called, what, 2,000 people before the trial to sort of sift through to try to find people who are as unbiased as possible. Yeah. So yes, it is possible. And now we have another question that comes in from Jose. Um, and this, again, goes to the relationship between um, Millard and Smitch. 
Jose asks, I'm wondering if you can comment as to whether or not you think the animosity between the two is genuine or just a convenient act for their own purposes. I, I'm not sure if there's a benefit to portray animosity in the trial. Uh, what do you, what do you, how would you respond to that? Oh, I mean, uh, you know, the, everything, I, love and hate are two opposites and they, they can, you can harness the energy of both emotions in the same way. And I mean, these men were like brothers. We, mm -hmm. we saw all these text messages that they actually said to each other things in the, on along the lines of, you know, you're my, you're my bro, uh, I, I love you, man, stuff like that. And I mean, that works the same way in reverse, right? We heard so much about how Mark Smith looked up to Dylan Millard, how mm -hmm. he envied his lifestyle, uh, and Millard was going to help him become this rapper. I mean, they were, they were very, very close. And I think as they, this rift developed between them and they got into this, what they call in law, cutthroat defense, that animosity just widened the gap. Yes. And I mean, you use that same emotion to throw fuel in the fire and it can burn either way. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think it was fake. I don't think yeah. it was put on. I think it's real. It, I, that's the sense that I get. I mean, we haven't talked to either of them, obviously, but yeah. it, it, it doesn't strike me as an act. I, I don't get, I mean, there's times in that trial where I felt like it, things were an act. Christina Nuka comes to mind yes. immediately. Is that right? Why is that? Uh, well, I mean, if you have an entire courtroom outright laugh at some of your responses because yeah. they're so ridiculous, mm -hmm. I mean, she, she was covering herself for her own trial, it seems like, in a lot of cases, but I, I didn't get that sort of sense from Millard and Smitch. I never felt like they were just in on some sort of thing where they were, they were going to do this for the benefit of the jury. I, I, I think that's kind of where they're at as people right now. They're, they're not friends anymore, I guess. And I would say there was tension when it first started a little bit. But that only grew once Smitch took the stand yeah. and he started telling his version and it was suddenly at every moment he could, no, that was Millard, it wasn't me. Yeah. Well, why don't you ask Millard that? Oh, wait, he's not taking the stand. You know what I mean? So that's when we saw things, I think, really kind of heighten between the two. Yeah, he really snipe at him at times. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. As much as he could, really. As much as he could, yeah. yes. Did you think that the perceptions of Smitch changed during the trial? Yeah. Oh, I think so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he was always, uh, most parts he was overshadowed by Millard. I mean, even the stature of the two men, Millard is taller, richer. Um, he had all the friends, he had all these people in orbit around him. And, and Smitch, uh, you know, lived with his mother and had no job and, and uh, slung pot. He, he wasn't this charming character and he wasn't, didn't have all the glitter that Millard had. But when he took the stand and he testified, we saw that not only is he intelligent, uh, and he can, he can navigate his way around things, but he also stood up to some pretty tough cross-examination from Smitch's, sorry, not Smitch's lawyers, Millard's lawyers. So we saw that he's not only smart, but he's, he's tough and he's yeah. stubborn. He's stuck to his story. Mm -hmm. Through, was it a week of testimony or a week of cross and two days of testimony in chief? I mean, it was just, he, ne he never deviated. He, he stuck to his version of events. I mean, it was, he was much smarter than I had originally given him credit for. Right. It, 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 within, I'd say, the first hour of his testimony, you kind of got this sense of the picture I had of this man is not who he is. Yeah. And you never really get that until you hear him talk. And it shifted because, yes, you heard him testify. And what I thought was interesting about his testimony is how much he turned and addressed the jury. Yeah. Like he was explaining rap music and why it's an artistic form and, you know, it doesn't indicate anything about him, but it was his art. Um, so you had his testimony, but then Millard's lawyer had a chance to pick him apart for days and days, and the Crown had a chance. And so my perception of him shifted throughout that as well. Yes. So we have another question from Facebook. This one comes from Monique, and uh, thank you for asking that. How has the public been? In the courtroom and outside, has there been much emotion shown uh, any supporters who've attended? What have you noticed about what's happening outside the courtroom? Uh, for the most part, it seems like they're pretty positive. There have been days where I'm amazed that there are people shouting about a line to get into a murder trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've found that kind of disgusting, honestly, when you have a family standing 10 feet away mm. who are grieving, you know, one of the most important people in their life and 10 feet away, you gotta watch people screaming, you know, you cut in line, that's my spot. It was very bizarre. But I think those are outliers, and for the most part, the people that went to that trial and attended, 
uh, were pretty respectful, and I think they understood that, uh, you know, how important it was that they they give that family the, the room that they needed to do the things they needed to do and that they were there to be observers, not to be involved. Well, and, and their commitment in some cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we were standing on the street the other day and one of the other reporters knew somebody in the public gallery and she said, uh, I, you know, I've, I've been following this for four months and now I have to start a job and I won't be able to see it finish. Oh. And she was disappointed. Hmm. I'm curious just to ask Colin a question because this is sort of the first major trial I've covered, but you've been at others. Have you seen the public gallery like lineups every day for four months like that? Uh, well, the, the other big trial I did was uh, Tory Stafford and, and yeah, I mean mm -hmm. it, was, it was lined up and uh, it, the courtroom was full and the overflow courtroom was full. And, um, especially when they come under the national spotlight like this and there's a big dramatic thing and you know somebody dies under tragic circumstances and yeah of course people are just riveted mm -hmm. but yeah it was it was the same thing there was no fighting in line though I mean that's that was a new one for me and and as Adam said I mean that uh, that just seemed so low and base especially with the family right there right what what about inside the courtroom were there any incidents or uh, any notable interactions with uh, people as they were observing? There was a man who fell asleep one day. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and everybody was trying to wake him up before the judge noticed. But um, forgot about that. not that I can recall. I think that there has been testimony that has been so gruesome and yeah. so emotional that there are days where you can just hear people crying. Oh, yeah. and, for sure. oh. and it is the family, but it's also in other rows, right? And you all feel it. And I, I know um, the judge during his instructions said to the jury, okay, remove all emotion, all sympathy. But to me, that's what this trial has been, such extremes of emotion, where you have perfect strangers crying in court over what they're hearing. Um, that was something that, I, that stood out to me for members of the public being there. Yeah, there's no way to sit through that four and a half months and not feel something. Mm -hmm. there, yeah. There's no way to completely remove yourself from emotion or, it, I mean, for the public, for reporters, for anybody, there's no way you can sit there and not feel it some days. It's, and I mean, however it is for the public or us, it's amplified by a million for the family. Right. So I can only, yes. I, I can't even imagine the sort of things that they're feeling their day to day. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting some responses on Facebook from people who, when they process their own emotions about what has happened in the case, uh, they wonder about Millard's mother and why she never testified about wiping the prints off of the trailer in the driveway and about being Millard's messenger uh, for letters from jail. Uh, what are your thoughts about her absence from testimony, but also uh, it appears very often her absence from court? So she was subpoenaed as a witness by the Crown, but was never called. So because she was subpoenaed as a witness, she can't go to court. Uh, she just can't be there. Mm. Um, as for why she was never charged or anything like that, so when we found out that uh, Madeline Burns, Millard's mother, had directed Christina Nuga as to where to wipe on the trailer, that was the first time anyone heard that. No one knew about that. The police didn't know, the Crown didn't know, because the Crown hadn't pre-interviewed Nuga. So that was all fresh, that was all new. No one knew that. So, I mean, I, I can't speculate if the police would look into that further. Now, after the trial, I really have no idea. But uh, yeah, they, they just didn't know that. And I suppose, is there a question of credibility for Nuka saying that, that she was told to do that, right? Yeah, that there's that her, too. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot in, packed in with that statement, <laughs> right, I think. Right, right, yes. No, I, I get asked about Millard's mother quite a bit, but... Um. Yeah, she's, yeah, I get that question a lot too, and I mean, she's, we look for her every day. Mm -hmm. She hasn't been there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think also too, from the Crown's perspective, I mean, that's her son. No matter, you know, whether, whether he's guilty or not, I, I would assume a mother would love her son, and that's a potential hostile witness. And right. that's, that's a potential problem for the Crown. Yeah. So we've read in the last few days about the complex set of instructions delivered by the judge to the jury. Um, we have one question uh, from Annie and Bonnie on Facebook, thanks for that. During the judge's final question, uh, instructions, um, there was one final legal argument which paused the proceedings. Annie and Bonnie want to know if you can tell us what that was about. Yeah, that's our fault. Uh, the media 
uh, was looking, there was a lot of talk about what should and shouldn't be in or out when it comes to the extended publication ban on the case. So we were just looking for some clarity on uh, what we're allowed to publish. So that solves that mystery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, more about you. Uh, Jade asks, has covering this trial changed you personally or professionally? If so, how? I know, Adam, for you, this is um, a new experience. You haven't covered a trial very much like this. Uh, maybe we can begin with your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, professionally, for sure, because I've never covered something of this scope before. I've never had this kind of audience before. The interest for this trial is truly across Canada and outside of Canada. I get emails and uh, people tweet at me from all over the place. So, I mean, it's uh, in that sense, it's been interesting to see just how far reaching it is and to be able to talk to so many different people. Um, personally, I mean, yeah, to a point, I mean, you, again, you can't sit there and look at a family who are being told how their son died in such a terrible way and not feel something and not, and not have it kind of affect you and how you look at people and how you look at, I mean, it's a two side of the coin thing where you look at this family has had to deal with something so terrible and it's so awful and it makes you think that there's no hope for humanity in some ways, but then at the same time you look across the island you see four rows of people who are there supporting them. So it's a, it's a constant balance for that. So yeah, I don't know if that answer makes any sense whatsoever, but it, it definitely has given me pause for thought about a lot of things. What about you, Shannon? I do get asked this quite a bit too. People ask if I have a vacation coming up or <laughs> some kind of break um, when this is all over. Um, yeah, and I mean, in journalism school, yeah, you're supposed to be the impartial observer, cut off all emotions, but it's impossible. And, um, but what I always think of, you know, days when it's over and the adrenaline has rushed out of you and you're just sort of sitting there thinking about all that you've heard, I just, I think, I don't know, I never even knew Tim, right? So. For me to feel sad or emotional, I just, I always think of that family. And I think as Adam mentioned, seeing the support that they have and their strength and their humor um, is a balance to all of that because they're surviving and they've been surviving for three years. And uh, they're just always in my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. How about you, Colin? Um, you know, it's sort of along the same lines. Like one of the things I've noticed is I've I've done a number of trials up to this point, and I, I think I'm, I have a lot thicker skin than I used to when I was younger, uh, and and less experienced. But one of the things I've also noticed is just seeing the strength of the Bosmas and seeing how uh, they relied on their faith, faith to weather that storm and and to get them through the the darker parts of this uh, proceeding. I'm I'm. I don't know. I mean, I, I find it fascinating, and I'm I, I see the world in a different way. Like I've I've seen them pray and stuff like that, and they they talk about you know they have faith that the jury will deliver the justice that they want, mm -hmm. and uh, it's an interesting lens to see the world. And sometimes uh, I don't know. Before now, I I don't think I ever really thought of things happen for a reason or things happen a certain way, but I'm I'm appreciating their sense that their sense of that and that point of view, and I think. I'm seeing it more often than I did before. We've only got a couple more minutes left in this conversation, and uh, we would love to extend it and spend more time taking your questions on Facebook. However, you guys have to get back to work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're a little worried that the jury might get called in at right. any point. Right, that's why our cell phones are <laughs> we're not trying to be rude. Okay, yeah. We're not bored, we just gotta make sure that they're, right. not, they're not coming back. Uh, now about that, Lissa asks when uh, we might know the sentence. What, what's the process at this point from now on? Uh, are you talking the sentence or the jury? The jury, or, well, sorry, well, the, 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 the sentence um, is how the question was phrased, but more accurate, accurately, when will we know that the jury comes back and uh, will be ready to hear the sentence. Yeah, I hear mean, the there's really no way to know when they're going to come back. It could be 10 minutes from now. It could be a week from now. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot to sift through. I, I would be very surprised if it was today. If I was a betting man, I would say maybe Wednesday or Thursday, but I could be absolutely proven wrong. Well, and then there's, uh, there may be a, a complete, they, they might do it right there. They might do it in a completely different sentencing hearing. Um, it, it all depends on whether the family is preparing victim impact statements, which they would read to the court, and how long it takes them to gather their thoughts and put together, you know, how this entire ordeal has made them feel. Yeah. I mean, 
that's a that's a world of hurt that you have to put on a piece of paper. And I would think that there would be some real soul searching and trying to figure out exactly what you want to say. We have uh, one last question. It's going to be, I think, difficult for you to answer, but we have a few people who uh, have been asking. Leslie asks the question on Facebook, since you sat in the courtroom every single day, what do you think the verdict will be? Um, and how long do you think it will take? Well, we don't know about how long, but uh, what do you think about... Uh, you don't even know what the verdict will be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it, yeah. it's impossible to know. You can't predict what a jury's going to do. No. I mean, it's easy to sit there as an observer, and I say that as for people at home, and I say that as us, and try to come to your own conclusions, but right. we don't have the pressure that that jury has. We don't right. have that feeling on your shoulders that you are actually deciding something this important. And I, I don't think anyone, until you're, you do it, and I say that as someone who hasn't been a juror, can know what that's like and what that pressure is like and how it informs your decisions and everything else. So, And I think we've heard information that the jury hasn't, yes. which may sway our decision one way or the other. It's true. So we have this additional information, which Adam had the article yesterday, all the things the jury didn't hear. So that would likely shape our opinions maybe a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed it, and I think um, the people joining us on Facebook have enjoyed it as well. I've also appreciated that at the CBC at least and in other places, I've been able to hear and read and see about the trial in any way that I'd like, um, watching your reports on television, listening to yours on the radio and reading yours uh, moment by moment at the trial. Uh, I can tell you that our readers have appreciated that very much as well. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for joining us. And we'll look forward to reading, seeing, and hearing how this ends. Mm. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, appreciate thanks. it. Thanks okay. for thank you. Us. Thank you. Once again, Colin Butler from CBC Radio, Shannon Martin from CBC Television, and Adam Carter from CBC Hamilton Online. Thank you for joining our Facebook Live event. We look forward to telling you more about the Tim Bosma trial.